built after World War II. The golden age of skyscraper construction was over, but today, the Empire State Building remains more than a majestic reminder of a bygone era. It is still the symbol of New York City. March 1st, 1932. In the sleepy New Jersey town of Hopewell, the crime of the century was committed. America's aviation hero, Charles Lindbergh, made world news again when his 20-month-old son, Charles Jr., was kidnapped from the nursery of his home by an intruder. The only clues to the crime were a homemade ladder, some muddy footprints, and a ransom note for $50,000. The largest manhunt in American history was begun in hopes of finding the baby and the abductor. Even the Lindberghs joined the search. Hello, everybody. We're speaking to you now from the general store in Hopewell, New Jersey, the improvised uh, press headquarters uh, during the Lindbergh case. We have here a flash which reads as follows. If the kidnappers of our child are unwilling to deal directly... We the Lindbergh statement the said that they would do whatever was asked for the safe return of their baby. More ransom notes were received and payments were made. One $50,000 payment was dropped over a cemetery wall by Lindbergh family friend, Dr. John Condon, who heard the voice of the blackmailer. The baby, however, was never returned. Despite the greatest manhunt in history, the baby's murder was not discovered until his little body was found here in the woods near his home two months later. The discovery of the baby's body in May solved half the crime, but the kidnapper was still at large. Police and federal agents followed up countless leads, but it would be more than two years before an arrest of substance would be made in the case. Finally, in September of 1934, law enforcement officials released this stunning statement. We have in custody the man who received the ransom money. His name is Bernard Richard Hauptmann, 1279 East 222nd Street, in the borough of the Bronx in the city of New York. He came to this country as a stowaway 11 years ago. He is an alien, unlawfully, in the country. Will this solve the Lindbergh kidnapping? In the opinion of all three of us, yes. In this garage across the street from the Hauptmann home, $13,750 of the ransom money shown here was found. Two cans were stuffed with the gold certificates and it was the passing of a gold certificate to Walter Lyle, a gas station attendant, that led to Hauptmann's arrest. With the arrest of Hauptmann, the crime of the century now became the trial of the century. The prosecution, handled by no less than New Jersey's Attorney General, David Wylance, presented its case to the jury of eight men and four women. America's leading newsmen, Walter Winchell and Damon Runyon, were among the 400 reporters that covered the case. Every word was recorded and sent around the world. With the physical evidence against Hoffman on display, the jury saw a parade of witnesses, including Charles Lindbergh, Anne Lindbergh, and a collection of handwriting experts. The evidence is unmistakable. Mr. Hoffman might just as well have signed each one of these ransom notes. So convincing to my mind is the proof that he did write them. Even with the flood of evidence, defense attorney Edward J. Riley was confident that he could prove Hauptmann's innocence. Watch our witnesses. They will develop a perfect case for the defense. But Hauptmann proved to be the weak link in his own defense. Under Wyland's tough cross-examination, he admitted a lie. When you were arrested with this Lindbergh ransom money, you had a $20 bill. Lindbergh ransom money, did they ask you what it was about? Did I ask you? You did. Did you lie to him or did you tell him the truth? Did you lie to him or did you tell him the truth? I, I said nothing, You lied, didn't you? I did, yes. New Jersey has rested its case, convinced that it has clearly established that the defendant, Hoffman, came to the state of New Jersey on the night of March the 1st, 1932, that the ladder which he built placed that ladder against the wall of the Lindbergh home and went into the Lindbergh home and murdered the child. The jury returned with a verdict, guilty of murder in the first degree. 
After the trial, Charles and Ann Lindbergh moved to England. Halpman was sent to the electric chair, still denying his guilt. And the events of March 1st, 1932, would have lasting repercussions when Congress passed the Lindbergh Act, a law making kidnapping a federal crime. May 21st, 1932. Amelia Earhart flew into history when she became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. Dubbed Lady Lindy in tribute to Charles Lindbergh, the 34-year-old Earhart's flight captured the hearts of millions as she piloted her red and gold Lockheed Vega from Newfoundland to Ireland in 15 hours and 39 minutes. I've done it. Those were Lady Lindy's words when she got out of her machine in the field near the little village of Calmore. And all the villagers cheered her. Isn't she amazing? She doesn't look as though she's just battled with the elements for 2,000 miles in one of the most wonderful flights ever made, does she? Amelia Earhart had been a pre-med student, nurse's aide, telephone operator, truck driver, social worker, lecturer, and writer. But her true love was aviation. She bought her first airplane in 1922, and three months later, she set a women's altitude record of 14,000 feet. Earhart had first gained prominence in 1928 when she had accompanied pilot Wilma Stoltz on a flight across the Atlantic and became the first woman to cross the ocean by air. Even though the 29-year-old had logged over 500 hours solo flight time herself, on this trip, she was relegated to the passenger seat. Flying in a multi-engine Fokker, they took off from Boston and landed in South Wales after a 22-hour flight. Their craft averaged slightly over 120 miles per hour. In London, Earhart was received by British society for her achievement and became an instant international celebrity. In 1937, Earhart was ready to pilot a flight around the world. She chose the most difficult route, 27,000 miles along the equator. She said, I do it because I must do it. Women must try to do things men have tried. When they fail, their failure must be a challenge to others. Unfortunately, tragedy ensued. In the midst of Earhart's trip with experienced navigator Frederick Noonan, transmission was broken with the Coast Guard, and her plane was lost at sea. The world will long remember May 21, 1932, when Amelia Earhart flew into history and challenged the aviation world and women to follow.